Okay, welcome everybody. We are now going to begin the third of our um, third, you know, um, of this, um, you know, segment of um, social dis dating during social distancing. And we have the honor to have with us tonight Rabbi um, Davidowitz, who is the rabbi in the girl zone in the camp, in the religious camp in upstate New York. And I will give it over to Rabbi Davidowitz. Good evening, everybody. It's, uh, it's amazing to see all these names here, all these people. It's like, it's such a world. I have to tell you that when I first did this Zoom, I, uh, I have to teach my class. I didn't know how to get on. I didn't know how to get off. I called up one of my students. I have chats on the cell phone with my students for the last maybe 10 years. I have a chat for each class. And I called up one of my students this year. I said, could you please help me? Tell me what to do. And I got on. And it's amazing what you could do today. You could talk and you could meet with everybody, you could see them. Of course, tonight the people want to be modest, so they're hiding their faces and so on, which is fine. But you see their name, maybe the real name, maybe they're not the name. You have some Baruch Hashem, you have a Purim or whatever, right? It's amazing what you could do here at this uh, time today. So it's also, it's equally amazing that we find ourselves in such a situation like this, that we have to be socially distant yeah. And we can't be uh, close with each other. Even as Pesach is coming, there's so many people that have a hard time to be themselves. I'm telling you, every day I get so many calls from kids in the zone. They, uh, I have a, a girl who came home from school. She goes out of town to yeshiva. And they have to close because they don't have to close. And she's home. And her family doesn't, uh, you know, not Shabbos, not kosher, certainly not Pesach. And she never expected to be home for Pesach. And now she's not only home for Pesach, but she's home for two weeks before that. And she is going out of her mind. She, it's so, it's so, so difficult. And usually we would, everybody would reach out, let me invite them. But today, you know, I'm told you can't, even my own children, Baruch Hashem, they didn't ask me so much. They usually do come. One of them still said, no, I'm coming, I'm coming. I, uh, you know, we can't, we can't do it. So here we're talking tonight about dating. It's, it's an amazing thing that we have to date, even though we can't go socially, we can't be close with each other. So I want to talk about a few things. First, of course, we, I said purposely, we have to date. We can't push life off at certainly such an important part of our life as finding our partner. It's, a, it's a, probably it's the biggest decision we make in our lifetime. And when you do, you start your whole life over again. When a person is learning Torah, the Shulchan Aruch writes, his Torah is only half Torah until he's married. His Torah, his learning, his character, his building himself, his person. He's only a half a person. And of course, she's also only a half a person until they find their, their partner in life. Now, you know, if there are people that have a hard time, it doesn't mean that you're not a person by yourself. God forbid, it doesn't mean that. But it means we have to do our part. We do our part and we're, we'll be sure to to, to find their partner right away. If we do the right thing, Hashem will certainly will take care of us. He's watching us just like today. People think that this virus came because of some country, that they ate certain things. Who knows what? It came because Hashem wanted it to come. We don't know why exactly. And everybody you know, has their own lessons. There is a lesson, certainly. Each person has to take his own personal lesson. But nothing happens by itself. A person, till they find their mate, their partner, it's, there's a reason. There's a purpose that maybe... I'll tell you a little later a reason why I took, I went out when I was going out over 40 years ago. And I was a young fellow and I went out with my, eventually with my wife, but I had to wait four years later. She said no until four years later. And four years later, my life was different and things went differently in the dating scene with her. It was amazing, I'll tell you about it later. But there's a reason why we have to wait sometimes for the right person. Sometimes it's hard, obviously, for something that's so important. <coughs> Excuse me. We have to work very hard. Something that's worth a lot takes a lot of effort. There's no question. I'm sitting here talking, and you people are saying, what do you mean a lot of effort? That's enough already. I understand that. That's true. It's enough already. But we have to dive in for it, and we have to do our part, and maybe you have to call up the Shatchanim and yell at them a little bit. Come on, get to work, do things, you know. But the main thing I just want to say first is that we can't stop. We can't interrupt it. We have to keep on going and try, like everything that we're doing in our lifetime. Sometimes we meet a snag. Sometimes Hashem 
throws us a curveball, and sometimes it's difficult to continue. We have to get up. If a person falls down seven times, as long as he gets up eight times, he's on the road to doing the right thing. As many times as we fall, we've got to get up one more time. So this is really something that's it's throwing a curveball at us. It makes it more difficult. Obviously, dating, you know, you have to, you have to be socially distant now. That's very, very important. But like Rabbi Min said, I hope maybe later they're going to forward to you his video. Rabbi Chaim Mintz, our leader, he said very simply that you can't put it out on hold and you have to find other ways. Meanwhile, at least till hopefully this will go away soon. But meanwhile, you'll go out a different way. When I was younger, more than 40 years ago, the dating style was that the boy got a number. First, of course, they found out about each other. But after they found out and they agreed to try to meet each other, the boy called her up. I remember I would call her up. Before I call her up, I was very shy. And I made notes for myself to make sure I called her the right name. I had to make sure I say she's in the right school and her job. I made notes and I held her in front of me. I was on the phone. It wasn't like this, that you see each other and you have to be careful. I made notes and I called her up and we spoke a little bit, five, 10, sometimes 15 minutes, maybe sometimes longer. It was good not to keep it too long because then maybe you'll, you'll say things that you shouldn't say until she understands you. We called, I called her up and then we set a time. I asked what is a good day for you and a good time and, and we worked out. And sometimes it wasn't so good. I had a, a friend in those days in yeshiva. He came to me one time and he asked me, is it normal that every time I call up a girl to set up a, a date, she says she's on the way to Israel? Not one time, not two times. And uh, he had a hard time. I mean, till today, I'm sad to say, I don't want to say bad stories, you know, but he didn't get married. He's in his yeah. high 60s. I mean, he, look, he didn't look so good and he wasn't so put together and so on. But sometimes it didn't work out when you had to call a girl to make a date. But usually you call the, you knew already that you're setting up a date. You would call, you talk a little bit, and you make a date. Today, it seems, I know with all my children, uh, when they were going out, uh, it's not heard of anymore. Today, they don't talk to each other. You, uh, you give the, the shatchen your, what days are good for you, the girl gives and the boy, and she calls up or he calls up both parties and he arranges the date. You don't even talk to each other before. Today, certainly, if you know, if we can't meet each other in person yet because of this situation, which hopefully will go away soon. Meanwhile, you can meet on the phone. Today, you could do it like in the old days. As long as they understand why you're doing it, you know, you can arrange. The shot can arrange. Can he call you up? And when is a good time to call? That really will be the date. They'll call you up and he speak to you and you speak on the phone a little bit. Maybe you shouldn't talk so long. You talk, but you'll talk as, as long as it's comfortable. If you want, you could even use this kind of mechanics over here, the, the Zoom or the whatever else they have, I'm not so familiar with everything, but you could even see each other. I don't know if it's so good. Maybe it's not so bad. It depends on, each person depends on both of you. Sometimes the person wants to be more private. Sometimes they don't want. A lot of, I know a lot of times people ask me, Rabbi, can you send me a picture? I could send a picture, but pictures, no matter how they look, they can look beautiful, they can look so-so, they can look really, really good, but the picture it depends how you look at a picture. A person can look at the same picture and see good, and another person can see bad because it, it presents itself in a different way. Pictures are not so are not so honest. But look, if somebody asks for a picture, I try to talk them out of it. But if I have to, I'll send a picture here. So I'm saying maybe you won't use a picture. Maybe you won't use this mechanics to, to see each other. But at least you have to go out. If it's just talking, okay, so it's just talking. You talk on the phone. Sometimes it can be very pleasant, and you could talk one and two and three dates. And then you can't wait to meet each other. And then you're in for a shock because you picture a person in a certain way when you speak to them. And then when you meet them, hopefully it's a good shock. Wow, they, they look so different. Either way, you're surprised. Wow, they look so different than I was expecting. It's an amazing thing. So it could be fun and it could be exciting, but certainly if it's possible, if you don't mind it, certainly you should keep the dating going. You shouldn't push off such an important thing like this. I wanted to say maybe two things or three things, and then I'm going to, in the microphone to our main speaker here. I want to say that first in dating in general, whatever you're going to do now and this week and next week and the week after, however you're going to date, number one, I would like to say is to be honest. People like to be dishonest. They don't say the truth about their age. They don't say the truth about, about many things. It's, it's a lot of times a guy calls me up and he says, Rabbi, I'm going to meet up this girl tonight. Can I tell her? that I'm only 35. He's really 39. Can I say she's, I'm only 35? I said, if you say a date 35, what are you going to do if you get engaged? 
and she's going to buy a birthday present, and it's going to be the wrong birthday because you told her the wrong date. And then she's going to know that you were dishonest. I said, you can be vague if you want. You don't have to tell her. But if she asks you how old you are, you could say around, I'm close, I'm getting close to, to 35, 36. You could, but if you point out exactly when your birthday is, how old you are, so you're setting yourself up to tell her one day, hopefully she's the right girl, and you're going to tell her that you're dishonest. It's not such a pleasant thing. I don't think she would like it. So I think it's very important to be honest, to be straightforward, to be honest. I'm not saying to tell her everything. I have things in my family that I couldn't tell a girl. They'll never go out with me. So I asked my Rabbeim. I asked from Chaim Ince. He was my Rebbe that time. He still is. And he, he advised me, which things don't say right away. If it's not to, anything to do with you, my family is uh, who knows what, right? If I have, I have uh, siblings who are not religious, completely not religious. So it has nothing to do with me. It has an effect a little bit, but it has nothing to do with me. So why, do, if, if God forbid, somebody is sick in my family with a disease that, that is, is hereditary, so then you have to ask a question. Should I say, should I say? So I'm not saying to be honest, though, to say everything out loud to say everything right away in the beginning, but don't say something that's dishonest. That's, I think, is number one. You have to really be, be honest. You have to be straight. You have to talk positive. You have to be respectful. You have to be in a good mood if you're in a bad mood when you're going on a date. So maybe call her before and say, I hope you don't mind. I'm really not so, I'm not feeling so well. I don't want to push over the date. It's not nice. But you should know that I'm not, it's so good to be upfront. It's so good to be honest. It's real and you become real there's a certain feeling that, that the girl would, would like it. Number one, so that's number one, to be straight. Number two, I would like to say is what I said in the first place, is not to, to stop, not to give up, and not even to push it off. This is something that's very important. and something that uh, as time goes on, maybe it gets harder, maybe I get more settled where I am. It's important to, to keep it going. It's important to try, but also not to give up. As I'll tell you my own story soon, don't give up. Sometimes you feel like, it's not going to work. Of course, you, before you even date, you may say, she's never going to go for me. She's so put together. She's so polished. She's in such a good family. And they don't look at yourself and, and put yourself down. You don't know how other people will, be, will appreciate your family. They'll appreciate this. Everybody has positive aspects that you don't realize yourself. You're a humble person and you don't realize it. Don't talk for her. Don't uh, say it for her that she's not going to like you. You don't know what she's going to like. Just be positive and keep on trying. And don't give up. A person has to keep on trying. And sometimes a person says, I'm dating. If I have to tell you myself, I dated, I think, for eight or nine, maybe nine years. There was a time I was going to stop, especially since I felt that I already met my wife, but she didn't want to marry. I even came back from this date. And I told her, I've been mince. The girl said no, but I know this is the girl I'm going to marry. So I'm not going out anymore. I remember telling you this when I was 21, 22. I don't remember. And he laughed, you know, not laughing in the funny, but he said, no, it's not true. And at the end, I forced myself to go out. But at the end, at the end, I got back to that first girl and I married. So, I mean, somehow you want to say I knew, I don't know if I knew 100%, but I had such a feeling. And at the end, it worked. I'll tell you why it didn't work at first, but it worked eventually. So it's important not to give up. It's important to keep on trying. It's important to keep upbeat. Of course, it's important to daven. You have to daven. You have to ask Hashem. Everything that we do, we have to ask for help. Everything. I, I'm teaching for 40 years in, in Kirov and kids who are not. And sometimes you say the wrong thing. Sometimes you mess up. Sometimes you have to keep on asking, please, please help me. I should say the right thing. I talk now every day for 40 minutes, a 40 minute period on this Zoom. And every day without fail, it goes to an hour, an hour and a half. Today went an hour and a half. They keep on begging me, no, don't hang up. Put more. In class, as soon as I start speaking, all the heads are on the desk. They're sleeping. But here, I, I talk to them. Some of them are on a pillow, and they're still not sleeping. I said, what's with you guys? It's amazing. You're all up. There's so much that you can accomplish. You don't know really what you could do, and you don't really know how other people look at you. It's important not to give up. It's important to be strong. I want to tell you my own story, because I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't, I'm not looking at the time. But maybe the time is flying too fast. I don't want to take up this whole thing. I want to just tell you my own story, and then a story about an unbelievable great rabbi. My own story was... When I was younger, I was in yeshiva. In yeshiva, I did not speak. I didn't talk. I was very, very quiet. I sometimes tell my wife that if they would have all the studies like they have today, if they would have it in my days, maybe they would have said that I'm semi, whatever it is, that people don't talk. I said, I wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't doubt it if they would say that's, what, that's about me. And she understood what I meant because she knew me before I started talking also. We went out for two dates. My Rebbe said, another Rebbe of mine set it up. After the first date, I came home. I was excited, and the rabbi said, she said, no, you're too quiet. 
Say yes, my God, please do me a favor. Talk her into one. What could one more date hurt? It can't hurt. Talk her into one more date. I'll be loud. I'll be noisy. And I don't know how to be noisy. I didn't talk like I'm talking now. So he talked her into it. I don't know how much he had to push. I wasn't there. But she said, okay. I went out the next week and she came home. And this time she said, no way. Tell him goodbye. She said it nicely, I guess. I didn't hear it from her. But my Rebbe said, that's it. It's over. What could you do? Move on to the next one. I came back to Yeshiva. It was like, I used to stay in Borough Park. I stayed by this Rebbe's house when I was dating. It was too hard to go 12 or 1 o'clock back to Staten Island Yeshiva. And then I went back the next day, and Rabbi Miss asked me how to go, and I told him, I'm not going to get married because this is the girl. I want to marry this girl. He only went out two times. I said, I understand. I, I said, I'm very good for but she doesn't want to go out. I'm too quiet. He said, okay, don't worry. You'll go out. It took me really a long time to start going out again. I went out for four more years. Four years later, I went out unknowingly. I didn't know. I went out with my wife's best friend. And as soon as I went out with her, I knew it's not for me. I went out with her also four years earlier. I knew it's not, I didn't know it's her because she changed her. Her name was originally, uh, let's say, uh, let's say uh, uh, Rachel. And then later she became Rachel. Maybe she became super religious. I don't know. Her name, last name was like a Smith type of name. Very common. So I had no idea it's the same girl. But by that time I was 28. Whoever breathed, I was ready to go out with. If they breathe, if, they, if they're normal, if they're human. So I went out, and as soon as I saw her, I remember her. I don't know why she went out. Uh, she knew who I was. I didn't change my name. But I went out, and I knew it's not for me. That night, she called up my, my wife, who wasn't my wife yet, and she said, I have a great guy for you. And she started telling her about me. So my wife said, okay, so why are you beating around the bush? Just tell me who he is. She said, well, because you went out with him once. She said, okay, so I'll, I'll go again. She said, okay, this is his name, Avi Davidowitz. Him? No way. She said, as soon as you heard my name, she said, no, goodbye. So her friend told her, look, you agreed a minute ago. What's going to hurt you one day? And she conned her into it. We went out one more day. But the difference in me was I wasn't in yeshiva anymore. It's four years later. I had my own school. I started a high school for Kiryu. I was talking to people. I was talking to students. I was talking to parents. Years before, Rabbi Mintz called up me, called me up one night. And he said, I heard that you speak in public. Is it true? I said, I have to. I, I have assemblies. I talked to parents. Could you please tell me, he said, when's the next time you're speaking? I want to come see. He didn't believe that it's possible. That I'm talking. He would probably wouldn't believe. Years ago, he wouldn't believe that I'm doing this either. But I, four years later, I had a school. I was different. Of course, some things I didn't do still. I was still a young kid. And I had to interview principals to hire principals for my school who's three times my age. So I asked a rabbi, a friend of mine with a gray beard, could you come please and just help me do the interview? And you're not going to accept the guy, but I want you to be there to make it look like I'm not such a little baby. My beard wasn't gray then. It was pure black. I was pure black for a lot of years. And eventually I went out with my wife and the first day that we went out, she, she, she wanted to get married. I mean, she didn't tell me that, but I told her and we knew already. I think maybe we went out twice. And then I said, you know, I want to propose to you. And she said, oh, great. She was so excited. I said, but it's going to look funny. We only went out two dates. So I'll go out five dates, and after the fifth date, we'll get engaged. I came, this is a side story. I came to pick her up for the fifth date. She forgot about it. She wasn't ready. She said, what, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? We made up. So I still don't joke to her until today that she owes me a date. But okay, we went out after that also, but she owes. But I'm just telling you that it wasn't right yet because I was a quiet guy. I was not what she, even though I was learning, she wanted really somebody who was learning. And I was teaching then, and she would rather, I was learning, but still my personality woke up. I was a different person. So sometimes it's not the time yet. What could you do? Don't give up. If you feel strongly, look, I don't know, I, I sort of gave up. It was four years ago. But I, I always had that in my mind. And I, it happened. And that's all your person has to give up trying. You have to try very hard. I want to tell you one little story about an unbelievable great rabbi. Everybody knows Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonnefeld. He was the chief rabbi of Yerushalayim in the beginning of the 1900s. About 30 or 40, 40 years ago, there was a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Gross, who were celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary, 6 with all their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And people were so inspired. Look at this couple, 60 years. They're probably close to 80. I imagine they got married around 20, 18, 19. They're close to their 80s already, 60 years. And they treated each other so respectfully. And they were so in love with each other still. After 60 years, so that everybody was dancing around them and they were singing. And finally, the grandfather looked, he looked at his wife, Mrs. Gross. He said, can I tell them the story? Yes. They had a story to tell, which was a little bit funny. He said, Grandma, right, this lady over here, she wasn't easy to get married. People 
We used to go out with her and they would break off. They would say no, but she was very rigid. She was super religious in the beginning of the 1900s, 1920, 30. It wasn't easy for her. And, and she, sometimes she went out and the guy would say, I'm not going out again. There were even times that she got engaged and the guy would break off the engagement. She said one time she got engaged to a fine fellow and everything went during the engagement went fine and they prepared for the wedding and it came the night of the wedding. And at the wedding, the maitre d' said, okay, where's the groom? Let's march him down to the, to the chuppah. They're looking all over, there's no groom. They're looking in the whole place. And finally the groom's parents came over to the kawa, to the bride's parents, and they didn't know what to say. They said quietly, our son came over to us, he chickened out. He can't go through with it. They're at the wedding. She's dressed in her gown, the guests are all there. The wedding's paid for, everything is rolling at full speed ahead. And the parents said, I'm sorry, he chickened out. I don't know what to say. We tried to push it off. We tried to talk into him into it, but it won't work. And now that we're coming to the moment of truth, I'm stuck. I don't know how to tell the bride. The bride didn't hear yet. I don't know how to tell her, but our son chickened out and he left alone. I'm so embarrassed. Rabbi, the Rosh the head of Yerushalayim, Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonnefeld overheard this conversation. And he thought to himself, what is this bride going to feel like if she knows right here that the groom walked out? What is she going to feel like? So he went outside looking for the groom, and all the groom's friends were outside sitting on the stoop. They were talking about what their friend did, and they said the groom is gone. So if Yosef Chaim Zonnefeld made an announcement, who wants a guarantee that your children and the great-grandchildren and the great-great-grandchildren will always be healthy and they'll stay religious and they'll be wholesome and they'll be close to each other? None of the issues that face all our kids today. Who wants a guarantee? And one by one, the friends got up and they walked away. I, I, I can't do this. But Mr. Gross said, I was there. I was one of the groom's friends. And I said, I know the girl a little bit because I'm very friendly with the groom. I said, what, what are you going to tell her? He said, we'll go in together and you'll sit and talk with her privately first. He said, okay, if I get such a promise, I'm in. This is what the, the grandfather said here. So he went inside the hall and they met privately with the bride. The bride knew him already. As a, and he said, that he broke it to her in a very sad way. I'm sorry, he had chickened out, but I'm happy. And the rabbi promised us a full life future of great kids and unbelievable children and healthy. And are you in? She thought about it. It was very strange. She wasn't used to the situation so fast yet, but she was at a wedding. And she was wearing a gown. And she said, okay, Hashem will help. It was different. Today, you can't do such a thing. Because today, we're so picky. We PC so many people. We'll never be able to agree to get married so, so quickly. But in that time, she said, and he's pointing to his wife. Grandma said, okay. She didn't know that I'm so bad, and she, she was still willing to suffer with me. It's an amazing. But look what Hashem did. I saved this bride from getting embarrassment. I saved her, and because of that, we merited such unbelievable brach. We, as ourselves, as the brides and grooms, we go out with each other. We have to be so careful that not to hurt each other's feelings. I'm not saying to go marry everybody. Obviously, you're married who you feel comfortable. You have to talk it over with your mentors to see, is this the right person? Can we make it? But you have to be so careful about the personality. You help the personality. You save each other from embarrassment, from feeling bad. You merit unbelievable blessings. And therefore, I want to end with one small thing. People today are so picky. They're so picky. There are so many people I talk to. Rabbi, I only want to marry her if she's willing to live in Flappish. I only want to marry her if she's willing to go to Israel. I must go to Israel. I must have, I want to have five children. I want to, what are you making all some kind of deals for? What do you care where you live? If you have the best wife in the world and you have the best family and the best home, you care where you live? I know you'd like to live in Israel. You'd like to go where you yeshiva. The guy says, my yeshiva is in Israel. I want to learn for a year. I only want to learn in Israel. You could say that I'd like to, but only don't be so rigid. A person has to be willing to give you have to make a compromise. Guys always ask me, what's the biggest trait you look for in a woman? And girls ask me, what's the biggest trait? The biggest trait is that a person should be able to bend. Like the reeds, the Torah is written with a reed because it bends. If you bend, you're going to make it. If you're stiff and you have to bend and you're stiff, it's going to crack. Hashem should bless all of us. That first we should, the world should be back to itself. The, the disease should leave all those that have it and all those that are around it and all those all of us that see other people suffering. Hashem should take in a second, he could take it away. In Mitzrayim, he brought a plague and in mid-ear, the hail, Pyro said, please pray and I'll let you go. He prayed it should stop and in the mid-ear, the hail just stopped right there. It didn't go to the ground. Hashem could do it in a second. He could end this 
we ask him to please take away this magefa. And he let us go on in life as usual. And Hashem should help us that our, person, our personality should be soft and easygoing. And Hashem should bring the right two people together. He should find the right shliach. There's a shliach, there's a person for every one of us. There's a partner for every one of us. Sometimes we have a difficulty in finding them. Hashem should help that we should find them. Our work should be that we should keep on working and keep on trying and keep on being positive and try to be a little bit soft. Don't bend, bend a little bit like the mezuzah on the door. It's bent to teach a, a man when he comes home. He has to bend. He had a hard day. Bend. Bend a little bit. Give in a little bit. Let things fly. Let things go. And let things go. Hashem will help that we will we'll find the right partners. And I'm, I want to thank this organization. It's amazing. Ura, I don't have to say it. Everybody knows they do everything for everybody from the A to Z. They try from, from the first subject to the last subject, from the top to the bottom. They look at every angle of everybody's life. And they should be the shliach. They should be one of the shliachim. The right shliach should come to help us all find, find our right partners. And I myself, in case anybody wants to talk, I have an office. I don't have an office, but I have a phone, an extension in the Ura office. If you feel free to call all the time, please. I try to meet people with each other. Sometimes I ask for resumes or whatever they have because I, I, I have been teaching boys for close to 45 years. And uh, I, I, I might know some boys. I'm not sure. A lot of them are not around. Maybe they're different types. I don't know. But uh, I do work in the girls' camp, even though I don't know if I know the whole thing. But I, we get to know people. If you please feel free to call whatever you want to do. Hashem should give everybody a tzlocha and they should have a chakash of a a good yontif, whether they're going to be by themselves. Somebody mentioned how difficult it is to be yourself. We're all by ourselves. None of us are having our family. None of us are having our students. My students always come. It's very, very difficult for everybody. It's not something that we wanted. It's something that Hashem gave us exerted for some reason, and we hope that it takes away. Everybody should be matzliah. And I want to thank you, thank you so, so much for listening. Have a good night, everybody. And now I want to introduce Dr. Frank the main speaker, he has all the answers, and hopefully he'll be the person that will lead you to where you all want to go. Have a, have a good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Hey, is that my cue? Yes, that's it. All right, here we go. Good job. I missed the first five minutes, so if I, uh, okay. if I repeat anything you said, I hope everyone there forgives me. Anyway, yeah, I'm Daniel Frank, calling, uh, logging on from Muncie, New York, in my bunker. And um, so just ahead of time, if you hear any crazy noises or tantrums, it's just what we're living with these last couple of weeks. Anyway, uh, okay, it's, uh, it's always nice to be part of a newer event. And um, I have a couple of questions that uh, I believe were sent over to me. And I'm going to use that as my, as my outline to, you know, to share some things and and maybe some share some things of my own that I uh, use free association to put into today's uh, conversation. Anyway, I think it's interactive. I see that the chat has been a little bit inter a little bit active. There's two chats in there. I didn't see what's in there. But if you have any questions, I mean, Leifer, how does that work? Yeah. So anyone that has any questions is welcome to um, put them, you know, on, and and um, if we have enough time, then you could address them. Okay. All right. So I'll fish, I'll fish into the chat section. You don't have end. to, you know, it could be near the end, whatever point you want. Okay. Got it. Okay. So it seems that, um, it seems that dating on, um, video conference is the issue of the day. Um, there's a new verb out there, which is to zoom. Zoom really, I guess the share has been really high lately, but uh, there are other platforms, believe it or not. Um, I'm more familiar with uh, Skype um, or WhatsApp, so whatever it may be. So there are a couple of questions here that relate to um, just, uh, I guess, uh, video conferencing. So let's go through some of those um, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so one question that came in was, um, should I be more flexible if I'm dating on Zoom? Yeah? Okay, question number one. So, um, so uh, I, I guess I guess it depends on what what you mean. Or whoever asked the question, what the question means. Should I be more flexible if I'm dating on Zoom? If uh, you've been holding back on shidduchim because of location, you know it's just not practical. You know I'm in America and she or he is in England. You know I'd like to marry an English person, but I'm not going to fly out there, or they're not going to fly out to me. 
So of course, why not take advantage of the situation and, and uh, now have access to people that you might not have otherwise dated for a first or second date? So if that's what we mean by being more flexible, then I think 100%, then you know, let location not be an issue. Um, if the issue is about being more flexible about your criteria, so then that depends also, because if um, you know about yourself that you've been pretty picky on the kinds of person, the per people that you would date, and you found that using cost and travel as an excuse, so then here also we say, you know, we could be a little more flexible because it's not going to cost and it's not traveling. Because um, sometimes that ends up becoming the, the, I guess the excuse, you know, it's not going to travel and I'm tired. And, but if you had reasonable criteria and if you really have reasonable criteria, then I wouldn't understand why Skype should make any difference. If you have reasonable criteria, and as this question doesn't include asking what reasonable criteria are, but so, but let's assume for the moment that we know what that means. If you have reasonable criteria, why should the fact that it's so easy and so convenient to Skype date that you would go ahead and actually do that? See, um, it's my feeling, I think a feeling of a lot of people that when it comes to shit of dating, there are, are a lot of um, um, uh, weaknesses to the system, but there are also a lot of positives. And one of those is the fact that we don't just date anybody, you know, it is a blind date, so we, we rely on Let's say it's a shotgun or anywhere else who recommends the date for us. But then we have to check it out. We have the, we have the luxury of being able to check people out. Um, the reason why that's an important step is that um, anything can happen when you like somebody. And it doesn't take long to like somebody. Um, you know, they say love at first sight. Um, if you get hooked on somebody within the first 20 minutes, it's going to be very difficult to be critical thinking about the things that really matter. And that's what I'm emphasizing here is about the things that really matter. So if your criteria include things that really matter, why just jump into a Skype date just because it's easy and convenient? Do the same checking out, make sure you have some person that fits those reasonable criteria, and then go ahead. So kind of a mixed answer here that, uh, you know, if distance has been a barrier for you, then that's not an issue. But otherwise, just to jump into a date because it's easy is also not such a smart thing to do. Okay, any questions, thoughts about that? I guess we'll continue on in there. Okay, so the second question about the, about the dating here is um, uh, the fear that you'll get to engagement, but then can't get engaged. The fear of reaching your limit on Zoom with no end in sight. So um, is, it, is it worth even starting if you play it out and realize that you're going to have to, it's going to, it's going to reach a peak and you're not going to be able to continue dating. So, so what's the, what's the recommendation about that? Yeah. I mean, zoom and, uh, and this kind of dating definitely has a limit. I really can't see it play through to engagement, maybe for Hasidish, but I don't really see how you're going to be able to, there's just a certain, you know, it's interesting. We've been taking walks every once in a while, staying a hundred feet away from everybody else around us. But like if, you know, if we see somebody like a human being, it's an incredible thing. I don't know if you've had the experience, but like, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a bunch of pixels. It's like a real person, you know, it's almost becoming like a novelty to see a real person. But, but I think what that means is that, again, I'm not sure if anybody here had the same kind of like experience that I had when I saw that, but there is something very different when you meet somebody in the flesh than when you meet them on a screen. So you all look good out there on the screen, especially all those that have your names on it. But, um, but it's never going to be the same as actually experiencing the person in real life. So there's going to be a limit to how far you can go when it comes to uh, video conferencing. But why get ahead of yourself? I mean, we, no one knows what's going to be. Um, and like Rabbi David says, who knows? Maybe, you know, in a snap of a finger, Hashem will take this all away from us. So I think in the same way that we're doing, dealing with every other aspect of our lives, our panasa, our shopping, our parenting, our whatever, I think we're all invoking the same strategy about everything in life, which is take each day at a time. We deal with what's here today and we don't know what's gonna to be tomorrow. And dating is no exception. So if you have a good shidduch and it's all available for it, then go for it and don't think too far ahead. 
take one date at a time. And then we'll see where it goes. We'll deal with it. If you end up, uh, you know, advancing very quickly on the Zoom uh, or this, you know, ask the question then. By the way, um, I know that um, some people are considering, or maybe they've done it, or, you know, whatever. I know that at least one couple has done a, um, a social distancing dating where they'll go out, but they'll meet in the park and stay whatever the minimum amount of the distance apart. So what can I say? You know what I mean? I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't do it and I wouldn't ask my kids to do it either. I mean, uh, it's, how, how are you going to maintain that? It's not easy to yell at each other for an entire date. You know, you're invariably going to come close to each other. So I don't know how that's practically going to be able to be an idea. So let's just stay with the uh, video conferencing for the moment. Um, so that's it. So it's the uncertainty of the day. You take each week, each date at a time, each day at a time. So the follow-up question was, you know, just kind of to address the limitations and the parameters of, of video conferencing dating. And, and by the way, when I, when I uh, this is the last question I have at least, unless I believe has more, but this is the last question about the video conferencing. So if you have any questions about that topic, so maybe we'll open up to that and then we'll continue with the other questions. So uh, limitations and parameters of dating. All right. Um, so basically what Zoom dating is, is that, uh, I mean, video conferencing is that you're basically just looking at each other. No distractions, nothing else to look at. Just looking at the other person for as long as you're having that date. Now we know that's very different than what happens in a real life date. You go to the house, you get in the car, you drive, talk about the neighborhood, you know, the, the conversation pieces that happen all, all along the way. You're not looking at your date. You're looking, if you're driving the car, you're looking forward. Uh, you look at it, you go into the lounge and uh, if that's your first date or whatever you go, I don't know, whatever you are, but you're looking around. You're not just looking at each other. But yeah, video conferencing is spending the entire time looking at each other. So it's very nice, but that creates its own set of challenges. Um, like I said, for one thing is it, it, there's not much to stimulate conversation. Um, usually, you know, we, we work off the environment. Um, talk about the menu. If you're at the restaurant, you know, you, you comment about what you saw when you came in, the line, <laughs> whatever, the, the service. So that's number one. Now we have to see how to accommodate these challenges. Um, the second thing is, um, for many people, there isn't much happening besides current events going on that can actually stimulate conversation. If you wanted a date on a Sunday and your next date was on Thursday, presumably you went to work, you met with friends, things were going on in your life. But for those that are not going to work and just kind of sitting around, maybe reading a book, I don't know, watching some shiurim, okay, there's stuff going on, but, but the, the content of what would show up during the week that can become put into play for conversation may be limited too. So we have a double challenge here. We have nothing going on in the date itself that's gonna give us food for a conversation. And we also may not have as much going on in our life unless we talk about current events, you know, the entire date, which is not gonna be so kishmak. So uh, that's challenge number two. So therefore, um, I think it's pretty, uh, pretty intuitive that in order to have a successful video conferencing dates, you got to keep it to a minimum. I would say 30 minutes to 40 minutes would be a fine date. Uh, don't, don't overdo it. Don't just don't overdo it. Just look at each other and talking and trying to manufacture conversation. And I think that it would be important to have an understanding before you start so that nobody feels like that's it. Half hour. Since when did I have a half hour date before? Just have an understanding. You know, it's a Zoom. You know, we're having a video conference. Let's try half an hour and we'll go from there. Or the shotgun can, can just make that as the understanding so there are no surprises. It might be, uh, you know, some people I know prepare their conversations, <clears throat> you know, conversation pieces in advance uh, for those that need that. And not everybody is such a great small talker and conversationalist. So uh, if that's what you do before a regular date, you might need to do a little bit more of that 
for a video conferencing date, simply because of the reason we said before. Um, also, the idea is to spread out the dates. Um, you may have a lot of time in your hands, but don't solve the problem with dating. <laughs> you know, hey, I'm not doing anything tomorrow anyway. Let's just date again tomorrow night, and then maybe tomorrow afternoon, the next day, three times a day. I mean, like, so spread spread it out because of the fact that it's going to get stale. Um, get some time in between. Now, um, so there you are. You know, but did let's mention the issue about. Um, Giving pictures before dates, yeah. So what did you say? Did you did you were your favorite bit or not? I don't remember what you said. So no, no. no? Anyway, what is your favorite? No. All right. So you know. So what's wrong with it? What's wrong with the picture? So you know, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a um, <laughs> you know if it's a hard copy, so it's just you know you get it the way that it is. But if it's on the computer screen, you can always like expand it and check every single detail. Like who's going to be able to pass the uh, the, the, the test when you were able to really analyze and study a person's face. Now, um, to a certain degree, when you're on a screen, I mean, I don't know, like the distance that I'm on the screen right now, I mean, I don't know how you're seeing me, but I see how, I see how I'm seeing myself, and I'm pretty I'm kind of filling up the screen with this part of my body and up. So you're almost like giving the person a, a picture to look at for 45 minutes. Um, so you got the same problem, but now it's 45 minutes of staring at you and, and you know what, we're not perfect. And if they catch that one part of us that we were hoping they were going to fixate on, they can do that. So, um, <coughs> so, uh, somebody made a suggestion that you should actually socially distance from the screen, even when you're doing the video conference dating. So take a step back, you know, kick back. Use it, use it. Uh, I don't have a microphone now because I'm not speaking through this. I'm speaking through the computer. But take the microphone with you, go back six feet from the computer screen, and uh, have like a scene. You know, you have the couch, just like you are if you're going on a date to a, I don't know, to a lobby or something, and there's two couches, and you're apart, you're one's on one couch, one's on the other couch. So really positioning on the screen might be an important thing to consider. Just, you know, not to be so close. Um, so that would be, um, right. Um, of course, it's a very important, you know, if you're, you know, if you're on the screen and you probably can't see it, but there's a cell phone right here. See, but if I put it below that screen, you don't see it, do you? No. So if I'm on a date with you and as you're talking, I'm like this, can you notice that I'm distracted? So, you, so even though I kept it out of sight, you don't really see it, but everybody can tell when you've got something else going on besides the person who's in front of you. So don't get distracted by technology. Don't look at text. Everybody can tell. And uh, I guess my final point about this is that um, <clears throat> just, I guess, keep in mind that everybody knows what's going on. And so whatever aspect of the video conference dating that comes across as awkward, the best thing to do with that is just to speak it out. You know, just, you know, speak about the fact that this is awkward. Whatever part of it that you feel is that way, share it because it, in all likelihood, the person you're dating on the other side on the screen is probably feeling awkward for either the same reason or for other reasons. So instead of just um, working through the awkwardness as if it's not, just speak it out. This is, this is kind of awkward, isn't it? It's almost like a little bit of the strategy that we use when awkward silence is happening. People get all kind of bent out of shape. There's an awkward silence. Just, just, okay, an awkward silence. Just identify it. You know, everyone goes through it and sometimes, and many people feel all comfortable about it. So instead of trying to push through it as if it didn't happen, just bring it up. <clears throat> so, so uh, the, the issue would be is what are the ways that you could de awkward the awkward when it comes to something like video conferencing? So you could say, like, you know, so you've done, you've dated once, okay, you did a half hour, 40 minutes, and it went very well. Then you go on a second date, because it's, a, it's a five days, a week later, and you feel, okay, time for a second date. This thing, the curfew hasn't lifted, so we're still stuck, you know, so we're going on a second date. 
and maybe, maybe by, now, by now you're up to the third date and you're starting to realize that, you know, maybe we need a little bit of diversity over here. So why not just say, you know, do you think we can do anything interesting on this third date on the video escape that could be different than just talking? And make that the conversation, you know, whether you want to make that conversation happen through the shakta, do you want to have it, you know, with the two of you as you start the date? Any ideas? You know, I don't know. I, I'm not the most creative guy when it comes to this. And I'm sure some of you out there may have some good ideas. In fact, maybe it would be a good idea if you could put something in the chat. Um, if you have any creative ideas about how, when it comes time to do something a little bit different than just sitting and talking, you can put it out there. But, you know, to play a game, I guess. You know, people go out to, you know, these game places and for a date. So if you have two screens, I don't know play a game of chess against each other and, you know, talk on the other, other screen. And I think that's one way to do it. Um, maybe, uh, you know, agree to go to a coffee shop together. So both of you make the coffee at the same time, you know, in the kitchen, you'll see each other's kitchens, whatever. I don't know. And just make whatever it is you're going to eat. And you sit down at the table and you're both eating whatever you both made together in your respective kitchens. You know, so you can just be interesting and creative about things and make it a little bit different than just being a straightforward conversation. But that's up to your own creativity and, and uh, doing that together. So those are some of the ideas that I threw together uh, to try to address some of the limitations and the, the limiting parameters of, of uh, video conferencing. Anyway, so I see that the chat is a little bit active. So I mean, Lee, I'm going to go down in there. Is that all right? Let's see what we got here. All right. Yeah, sure. Somebody asked me a question. Um, is it better because of all these different things to maybe just have phone calls as opposed to doing a Zoom? Is there more to gain off just a phone call? That's interesting because, you know, once upon a time, that's the way, at least in the Yeshiva community, that's really how it worked. You started with a phone call. Um, you know, now the Shachim does, I mean, it depends, it gets in the, it depends on the population, really. So, you know, I, I dated at a yeshiva, so I can just tell you when, back in those days, the Shachim gave you the name, told you when a good time, I think they even told, they told you a good time to call, maybe, like Monday night, she'll, you know, she's available. And you made a phone call. So you spoke like a half hour, 20 minutes on the phone as a way to build up to the dates. So, um, if people still do those kind of things, I think that'd be, you know, it'd be great because it's actually a little bit of a progression. I don't know if it's worth avoiding the video screen, you know, more than once. I mean, if you have a, a nice short phone conference, a phone call, and then, you know, 20 minutes, and then say, uh, you know, if you want to go on for the date. In fact, the way we did it back in those days was that the phone call was, it wasn't to check the person out and then go on the date. That, that was actually the, you got to go on a date. It was, that was a package deal. You got the first phone call and you got the dates. You know, and I, I find there's, I, I think there's some advantages to that, a little bit of the intrigue, you don't see the person right away. So you're, you know, getting a chance to experience the personality and the, who the person really is at another level before you, and you go face to face. But I can see that being as an option, but not, not, I don't know if I would stay with that. Uh, okay, I'm looking at the screen over here. Uh, oh, okay, so here's a, here's a, people are, do you think people are saying no to possible dates because of the virus pandemic and a lack of interest in dating via Zoom or phone call? Okay, um, so actually somebody, that's similar to something that somebody asked, um, let's see if I have a question over here. Um, okay, uh, is this the same? Particularly during this time, I find it difficult to connect with someone over phone, text, video. It's draining and hard to get a feel for the person in the long run being that we don't know how long this will last. Is it fair to start a relationship now and not know when you will meet? I mean, my, my thought is, um, you know, what's the rush? I mean, I know it's important, you know, to, when you're ready to date, it's important to date, but uh, there's a situation going on out here. And if you don't feel comfortable, I don't see why there's a need to rush. Something that came up and dealing with the awkwardness of doing it through video conferencing, then I'd say, yeah, then go for it. But if there's nothing going on and, and uh, it's a question about creating something, but you don't feel so comfortable, so unless there is a good reason to think there's a rush, then wait, wait a couple of weeks. People take breaks. The is coming up anyway. Pesach is coming. So um, anyway, can't wait a couple of weeks. Um, 
Okay. Uh, happy to take it to the next. I want to see the uh, the video conferencing questions. Uh, okay, I don't see any other. I don't think I see any other video conferencing ones. Okay. Okay. Uh, actually, someone mentioned something. Yeah, I find when I'm texting when I'm in a texting conversation at a certain point, it just goes dull. Oh, well, I believe. Please do me a favor. I don't want to. I don't want to bore everybody here. If you see something that is something that related to the video conferencing, they could just point it out to me, and I'll go further. I'll just keep on going. Okay, sure. Okay, so here we go. All right, so what are we holding? Oh. All right, so here's a. Um, um, This is not nothing to do with the you know with the situation. It's just regular shidduchim questions. Why does a what does a good resume actually look like? I've been told to put a short blurb about myself, but I've also been told to take it off because it's either too limiting or too intimidating. If a blurb is included, then what? Then what? Uh, what's the right way to write it? And what should be included to best represent yourself? Okay, about shidduch resumes. Uh, so. First of all, shidduch resumes, the nature of them is really subject to minig hamakum. It's based on the custom of the place. Uh, I find that the, the Moishiva community is very, very skimpy on what they share when it comes to the shidduch resume. It's basically just names of, you know, parents, siblings, in-laws, what they're doing, it's the facts. No, no, no bio or anything like that. But yet, um, in other circles, there is a descriptive about the person. So depending on which circle you're in, that's what be expected of you. Um, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how to direct someone in terms of what they should specifically write as a resume, what it should look like, but I will say this. It, if you're using the resume to to have some kind of representation of yourself, think about it as the same way, they the, the, say the 20 second elevator pitch, right? We all know about the elevator pitch. What are you gonna say when you go to the shotgun, I've said this many times, maybe you've heard this before, but you know, you go to the shotgun and the shotgun, okay, it's starting to change, but many shotgun would tell you, I would say to you something like, you know, tell me, uh, what are you looking for? And that's a shotgun, even friends would say this, so what are you looking for? And so what I've encouraged people to say, especially the guys, is if you want to stand apart from the rest, you just say something like this. You say, before I tell you what I'm looking for, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. Ah, very nice. So now we, a route, now we need a roadmap to be able to know what to say. So what am I going to say? It's one of my favorite questions to ask when I meet someone for the first time in my office. I'll, I'll say to them, so tell me about yourself. I can't tell you how many people have stumped with that question? Just say, tell you about yourself. So I'll get answers like this. Some of my favorite answers are things like, um, what do you want to know? So I'd say, whatever you want to tell me. Um, uh, I wear glasses, wearing a white shirt. Okay, good. I mean, these are things I could tell by looking, but okay, good start. Um, some people will say things like, there's not much to say, which is not really a good place to start. And then, and then, and then they might say, well, you know, I, I live here and I have, and, and I, I have three siblings and I, which is, which is good. We're getting better than describing the shirt. But even saying that, that gives me the context in, within which you live your life, but I still don't know about you. What do you want to tell me about you that gets me to know who you are? So I like to focus on two things specifically. I mean, actually the, the real definition of who I am is my character traits, but that's not something you're easily gonna be able to share. I'm, I'm a kind person, I'm a giving person, although many bios will say that, you know, and that's great. You know, if you feel comfortable sharing that, say I'm a kind, I'm giving, that's the most important thing that we need to know about you. But we also like to know what your values are, what's important to you. You know, what, what your values, if presumably that they're the ones that inform your big decisions, and how you live your life and how you want to live your life. So just mention some of the things that are important to you. Family is important to me, you know, chesed is important to me. So a couple of key words over there, but 
I like sometimes for people to substantiate the things that they say, because it's very easy to say to somebody, I'm caring and I value family and I value, let's say chesed or, you know, but, but what do you, what do you do specifically in your life that demonstrates that value? You know, so in, in your resume, it might show you volunteer for organization so that the value that you stated in your bio actually fits the things that you actually do in your life. So I would focus more on those things in a short to the point bio, um, keywords about, you know, character traits, values, things that are important to you. The things that you do are already listed in the other stuff. That's the stuff that we probably have even in the yeshiva resumes. So um, it's very difficult not knowing, oh, this is a long one actually. So let me skip to a shorter question. Oftentimes the shaka will speak to a single for five minutes and somehow know enough about the person. How can you be more informative within a short amount of time? Good question, huh? So um, I, I would say this. Um, the question is how can the shocker know somebody after speaking to them for five minutes? So you know that um, the expression about first impressions that is a very, uh, you know, first impression is last and whatever. Um, there's, um, I once saw a study and the study indicated, uh, it was actually very interesting what they did. They, they, the study went as follows. They, they had uh, people interviewing candidates for a job and that took place live in one of the rooms. And then they had a short circuit TV where they had other people that would watch, that would watch the interview and they gave a series of questions to the interviewers um, in both rooms. And it turned out that, um, that um, after a 20 minute interview, they, um, see, is this how it went? They all, I'm sorry, scratch that. Oh, it sounded too ridiculous what I was telling you just now. So it was ridiculous. Okay, it goes like this. They gave, they gave a 20 minute interview in, in one room, and the closed circuit TV only showed the first 20 seconds. Ah, that's the chav. And then they met, they, they had to answer, answer certain questions, and it turned out that the, they evaluated the candidate in a very similar way, which led them to conclude that you only need to know somebody for 20 seconds to really know who they are. You can get the DNA of somebody within 20 seconds and I have to spend the full 20 minutes with them. Now, obviously, if you're doing an interview where you're trying to understand, if you want to get, um, you know, their knowledge, you know, if it's the computer stuff and you need to know what their knowledge base is, so then you may need more than 20 seconds. But if you want to be able to, to assess somebody's character and their personality and who they are, it could take 20 seconds. Now, I just want to, just, just out of, you know, just for the sake of interest, I don't know if it's interesting to you, but there's a book called Blink. Some of you may know the book. And in the book Blink, it actually says that they did other studies. And it's pretty crazy, but they came out with this with one experiment where they had a college professor teach an entire semester. And then they showed a video clip of that college professor to another group of people. They took that clip and made it shorter and shorter to see how short can it be where they'll still come up with the same evaluation of the professor of the students that were there with the entire semester. And they got it down to two seconds. I, this is a book in blink, it's black and white, you take a look, you don't have to believe it. Down to two seconds without audio. Unbelievable. Without just visual of two seconds, they assessed the professor the same way that the students the entire semester. Okay, you don't have to believe it. But what it does say is that we give first impressions, and the first impressions we give are really, really quick. So five minutes with you, if it's a person who has a decent judge of character, I wouldn't necessarily say that they don't really know who you are. They haven't got a good reading on you. And I'll tell you the, to tell you the truth, I'm not so good at this. So that's why when people ask me if I'm a shocker and I say, not really. Um, I do more of the dating coaching, but I don't really, I would love to help people, but I, I just, I'm just not good at that. You know, I'm just not good at being able to pull the people together in that kind of way. But if you have a shotgun who really is, has a good read of character, it's not, it's not unheard of. It's a lot of time to spend five minutes with somebody. 
it's not even necessarily the content of what you're saying. You could be that they're picking up just on the vibes of how you present yourself, the way you talk. You know, because it's it, because we know this that, and it's maybe worthwhile saying this because if video conferencing spends so much time on the face-to-face -face interaction, it's worthwhile knowing the following statistic, which is that 93% 93% of what we say when we communicate to people is nonverbal. The breakdown is we communicate with our words, with our tone, with our body language, facial expression, body language. And the studies indicate that roughly 93% is made up of body language, facial expression, and tone. And only 7% is what you say. So you can really get to know somebody just by how they're presenting themselves. That's five minutes is plenty of time to figure that one out. They can tell if you're confident, they can tell if you're kind, they can tell if you're nervous, they can tell if you're, there's a lot of things you can tell about somebody. Five is a long time. So anyway, um, so that's as far as uh, the five minute meeting. But as I say, maybe it's worthwhile also realizing in terms of your own dating, dating um, to think about, pay attention to your, your nonverbals. Okay, pay attention to how you come across. Um, you may say all the right things with your words. By the way, I have a proof. If you don't believe that statistic, I'll tell it to you exactly like this. We all knew we grew up and we beat up our sisters or if we beat up our brothers, I guess, you know. Um, and our parents said to us things like, um, say sorry to your sister. Sorry. And he said, oh, say sorry. I said, I'm sorry. So we know that sorry is 7% words, 93%. 7% of you said sorry, but 93% have said I'm not sorry at all. So we, we know from early on that tone and facial expression, all that kind of stuff speaks much more loud than words, louder than words. So it's worthwhile to actually pay attention to that, to own our, own our nonverbals. And, and, and like anything else, if we're open to feedback, if we're not really sure how we come across, you can always find a good friend to say, by the way, how do I come across? All right. Okay, what do we have here? We have, um, okay, um, it would be first after nine o'clock. Is it bedtime? It's bedtime two hours ago. <laughs> Um, whatever you want. If you have more time, there's some more questions over here. You, uh, what, do we, what do we have here? Let's see what you have on the. On the uh, and there's someone's asking, um, let's say you went out or, you know, or Zoom or whatever it is, a couple of dates, and um, it was going well in the beginning, and then you get to a, uh, I guess you can call it a hump in the road, or you, you know, where there's some either, um, you know, a discussion that doesn't go so well, or a difference in opinions, things like that. Is that an indication you should just end it at that point? Or is that how much time, I guess, should you invest to try to work it out, to keep going? Or at which point? This is all video conferencing, right? Yeah, but I think it's really, it's really probably regular dating just as much as video conferencing. I don't know if well, it's- Well, I mean, because I think video conferencing is, you know, you're going you're gonna to run out very soon. I don't, I don't for most people, it's not going to be so sustainable. I mean, a couple of dates, and I think that you're going to really reach, reach your max, and it's going to start getting counter, counterproductive. It takes, it, it's, it's going to take a, a very specific kind of a couple that's going to thrive. You know, we think about dating, courting, there is a certain progression we want to experience, even if it's not necessarily a smooth, every day it gets better and better and better. But overall, the, the trend has to be trending upward. But it's, it's going to be hard to trend upward on, on a Zoom courtship. So, I, so if it's it, it specifically as it relates to Zoom, you might have to just notice that. That's why I said, Maybe date once every week. Don't even do it. I would even do it more than once a week because if you end up pulling three dates together in the course of three weeks, then it's a lot, you know? Yeah, um, so, and then if you get to that point and you went three times and you Zoomed it <laughs> for three weeks and if you had already done the Zoom three times and here you're sitting and wondering what's going to be next, I don't know. Maybe you got to do some of those creative ideas, you know, do a virtual uh, visit somewhere. I just got a, I just got a message somebody sent me an email today or whatever about a whole calendar of virtual virtual trips. You see that one? Every day, one day the San Diego Zoo, one day this. You know, you can actually link to the place, and I don't know. Someone's a creative out there. You can maybe do that for dating, but it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Look, we're, we're, we're it's uncharted territory. 
you know, and, and if you lived, if this happened when you, one person lives in California and the other lives in New York, you'd have to get on a plane by now, you know? So okay. we're, we're, this is a really invading and uncharted territory. So I don't know what happens after the third or so day. Because it's going to be hard to keep that momentum and to keep the trend going forward. Unless you do something really creative. You know? There's another question here about attraction on, on video dates. After a half hour, should you trust yourself or keep them going? And, and for how long? I guess, I'm a, I guess on a video, how, how much could you consider that as attraction or not attraction? If there's no attraction, is that maybe just because it's a video? Uh, okay, I hear. So in other words, you want to know how well could you trust yourself in evaluating looks when it comes to the video conferencing? Well, that's why I say you can't get engaged with it because you, you know, until you see them in the flesh, you know what I mean? Like you're not, not on whatever, it's, it's going to be different. But, but um, um, I, guess, I guess, you know, cut a little slack. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no right away if it's in the ballpark. You know, we talked about the issue about pictures before. I was meant to say that, you know, we, you know, if we send a picture. So wouldn't it be nice if we could send a picture, but just blur it so you just have like, you, know, you have an idea of the person, but you don't have the such, you know, just an idea, you know? Um, so maybe, maybe view the, the technology as a way to get kind of like, kind of like in the ballpark, but you can't really know until you see the person in, in person. So I would say cut a little slack about that. And again, second day, it's not gonna cost you anything, right? So the benefit over here is that for that, at least we can say it doesn't cost you anything. Um, I actually wanted to say, if you have, I have a, a, a closing remark over here. And um, so any, uh, uh, let me see, uh, let me see, let me call it a closing remark. Oh, I actually wanted to say something about uh, the video that's mentioned about being, uh, he mentioned about being um, um, uh, on integrity, right, that kind of stuff. It might be something funny because you said about the age, right? So the guy says he's, let's say, 35 and he's really, what, 34? So she'll buy him a cake that says 35 on it and it's like, what's, or 34? And it's, let's say, if I was had a conversation with a guy and he, he was lying about his age about three years. He was three years older than he said he was. So let's say he said he was 28, but he's only 25. So I said to him, I said, you know, there's, a, there's a concept like this. It's, it's, it's worth knowing this. There's a, it, a bit of it's mentioned that there are certain things you do share, some things you don't share, but keep one rule in mind. There's something called the Milsa David Alagulye, that which means there are certain things that are going to be found out. And if it's going to be found out, then you're, in, you're really playing with fire if you don't say it now. And it's going to get found out only after the chuppah, because at that point, it's no longer going to be about the thing you held back. It's going to have more to do with the fact that you betrayed them, and betrayal is a hard thing to overcome. So, but if it's a milsa of people agree, you really got to be careful. So I said to this guy, he's three years older. I, he's, I said, I mean, <laughs> okay, one year, fine. Okay, one year, big deal. Was one year, but three years, a lot of years. She should never find out. She's never going to find out. Hold on a second. I'm just figuring this out over here. You know, one day it's going to happen. You're going to file for some kind of like application, and she's going to say to you, oh, "By the way, what's your birthday?" You know. So he said, no, 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 I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to fill out all applications in the house. <laughs> um, I will fill out all applications for the next 80 years. I said, you're fine. So he's convinced it's never going to be found out. So I said, um, what about, um, okay, you, your, 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 your best friend who is in school with you your whole life has a 30th birthday party three years before you turn 30. Wife gets a call, you know, you have a surprise party for, it's like, why is he three years older than you and you were in the same class your whole life? So sometimes we can be so like, <clears throat> we can be so blinded by the fear of sharing the truth that we don't realize how obvious the information is to be found out. So keep that in mind when you want to hold things back. Okay, the one thing I wanted to share over here was, um, was, um, Everyone's in their, their own situation, as was mentioned before. Um, um, you know, again, in the whole group that's here today, I don't know what your living conditions are at the moment. You know, basically, it seems that wherever you are, that's your world. Whoever's in that 
place of location. That's your population. That's your playing field of life. Um, but um, but for those of you that are that are living with your parents, um, so um, for those of you that are living currently with your parents because of the situation, let's put it let's put it that way. If you're used to living with them, so you already have your mahalak. But if you're now living quarantined, shut down in the house with your parents, so um, <clears throat> the situation has created um, opportunities for growth within the place that you're living. All of us, all of us are given opportunities through the challenge of living with whoever it is that we're living in. But I would say this, I mean, I, you know, I, this is not, this is just a general statement. It's not to anyone specifically, obviously. So it could that be not relevant to anybody here in the group, but I feel I'd like to say it anyway. We're all looking for segulas. We're all looking for, and not just for segulas in this time because of what's going on, but you know, what's the right, what's segulas to help us get married? You know, that's our topic for today. Um, so I once did some research, extensive research um, about Hishtadlus, um, had the kind of ishtal that's necessary for shidduchim from a from a hashkafic point of view. It's it's actually a very interesting topic because you know there there are there are opinions out there that that really um, encourage very little um, hishtalus for shidduchim. It's interesting the chazanish, the biskarov. There's a lot of, you know, I just saw the Graban, uh, Gedolim that, that weighed in on this here, and it's, and it's interesting what they say. But I want to go through that whole thing right now. I just want to share one thing that Rogershon Edelstein, Shlita, who's the Roshiva in Panovich and, you know, Big Tzadik. So he was asked what single should do in order to do a, the right Hishtadlis. So he said three things. And I think that the three things that he said, and I heard this about a year ago, so it wasn't anything to do with the situation that we're in right now. But the three things that he said as Segulas for getting married, number one, Shmir Salashim, right? So we know everyone's been made, making the association between being locked down, quarantined to Tsaras, and so that has already been suggested as a, as a tikkun, you know, Shmir Salashim. So, According to Gershon Edelstein, it's a segula for getting married, and it happens to be something which is, which seems to make sense to us to be focusing on today. Second thing he said was a daven for one another. Okay, so a daven for another for a shidduch, daven for another for a poor shlema. There's a lot of davening that we're doing for each other today. So the second school is in place. The third school that he said was keep it up at aim. So, Maybe consider if you happen to be in a situation where you're closed in to people that you love dearly, but have a hard time living with them 24 seven, then maybe this is the time to really take that segula very seriously. You know, a lot of times parents are not sure how to relate to older singles in the house. Do we tell them what to do? Do we ask them to help? Are they supposed to be treated like that? Let them just do their own thing. I have to say, I, 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 I'm not thinking about this strictly in terms of singles. I've mentioned this already to families and family life and everything else, but this is not the time. This, uh, the world is in the same boat. This is not the time to withhold. Everyone's got to be there for each other. Everyone has to be supportive of each other. Everyone has to chip in, you know, give, it, you know, give a helping hand whenever, whenever's needed. I just think that, it, just thinking back to what Geshe Nehelsin said, you know, the Kibbutz of Ein piece um, would be a really good thing to focus on as, uh, as we go through this time and thinking about Shaduchim, that that might be the big segula to be, to be thinking about. And Bet Hashem, focusing on Shemesh HaLash and Kibbutz Ein, doubling for each other. All of you should find your Shaduchim, the right Shaduch, quickly, and we should all be Zohet to help you sure from what's going on right now. So that's my thoughts for tonight.
Okay, thank you very much, Rabbi Frank. Thank you very much, Rabbi Davidowitz. And everyone. I mean, I can, if you don't mind, Rabbi, if they want my number, I see that Rabbi Davidowitz put out his number. If they want, to, if they'd like a number to call me, I don't have a problem sharing it. So. Sure. So you could put it on. How do we do that? How do we do just that? put it on the chat. You can just re respond to all. You know, just. Oh, to everyone. If okay, so I'll put out my email address or whatever, and email address. Everybody yep. wants to be in touch. You're welcome to do that. Uh, Absolutely. Everybody publicly, I guess. Okay, everyone should have a happy Pesach. There you go. Okay, everybody, all the best.